Welcome to Fintech Impact. This podcast is an exploration of the financial technology world, interviewing different fintech entrepreneurs about what they do, their story, and what their impact is on consumers, incumbents, and the industry as a whole. Here's your host, award-winning financial planner, university lecturer, and writer, Jason Pereira. Hello and welcome to Fintech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have Charlie Conron. Charlie is the CTO and co-founder of Life Design Analysis. Life Design Analysis is an online tool for analysis and illustration of different insurance policies and products available to consumers. It is both a sales tool and a tracking tool in that it allows advisors to track their enforced policies as well as data mine those opportunities for future sale. And with that, here's my interview with Charlie Conron. Hello, Charlie. Hey, Jason. How are you? Very well. Thanks for taking the time today. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me on the uh, the program. So, Charlie of Life Design Analysis, uh, tell us about your company. So, Life Design Analysis, or you know, sometimes as we like to refer to it as LDA, uh, because it's a little bit of a mouthful, is really an online sales enablement platform. Um, it's designed to help advisors really service existing policyholders, so things that they have in force, as well as present new opportunities. Our whole focus is really that communication of insurance solutions to really the end consumer. And we really just help advisors do that by streamlining the process and, and really helping them check compliance boxes as they do that. Okay. So we'll come back to uh, the company in a minute. Uh, tell me about your, your journey and what led you to create the company. Actually, my story into the insurance industry is uh, is fairly interesting. I don't know if it's the typical journey. So um, my background, I went to school for mechanical engineering of all things and, and actually worked for a magnesium die casting company out in um, Stratford or Strathroy, excuse me, doing rapid prototyping work. And uh, had it so not been actually right for my... That is, that is not the conventional way into the industry, but continue. <laughs> no, <laughs> exactly. You know, had it not been for my stepfather, Larry Kinlan, I probably wouldn't have seen this industry. And, and it's kind of funny everywhere I go even in mechanical engineering um, my father was a computer programmer so I've I've been kind of self-taught for a long time how to operate a computer how to code from a very young age and and even when I worked in engineering it was always oh you can code well you know go to work on this sort of project or design this kind of macro they're used quite a bit and it was really through that journey that um, I got kind of started on the IT side and got very handy with that but as a result, my stepfather, who was actually a 50-year insurance veteran, yeah, I think about 53 years actually, he's recently passed, but he brought me in on an off day and said, what can technology do for the insurance world or his practice specifically? And I think, you know, I think he was expecting at the time, maybe he would get some new computers, maybe I'd set up some networking. But I really approached it from the consumer side. I said, you know, I get the concept of insurance, but I don't know entirely what it is that you do. So I said, you know, basically sell me some insurance. And I think I got the traditional insurance pitch, which is kind of the standard even to this day where I got, you know, a term 10 illustration, a UL and a whole life. And he said, here's sort of some options that you could present. Why don't you go and play in your traffic? And like every other engineer, right, I had to crunch numbers and and really see, you know, sort of the value of these products and, and how they operate over time. Um, and it was through sort of some Excel number crunching that I said, Larry, this uh, this whole life product and these really specifically these long term products are are so valuable. It's surprising you don't sell these all the time. So I really saw a communication issue. It was a confusing sort of outdated process with lots and lots of numbers uh, when ultimately I just wanted to see kind of really high level. What's the price? What's the value in an easy to digest way? And so I started making, um, you know, an Excel macro for him. And really, that was kind of the foray. I think he hired me two weeks later and, and he said, you know, I hate hiring family because if I hire you, then I may have to fire you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it was a successful journey. Um, from that point, we sort of evolved that software and that's what turned into LDA. So that was sort of my entrance into the, how I got introduced to the industry. Well, I mean, it's not surprising. Uh, he once made a joke on the podcast about term technology and insurance go to get like peanut butter and dirt. Because <laughs> as you know, having looked at various illustration softwares and whatever else it is we have to work with, it's pretty abysmal and pretty bleak, quite honestly. I mean, at least now we have some companies offering online application processes, but they're all different and they're not necessarily the greatest experience either. So anyone who's going to make it better, I commend you. So take us through the software and the experience for the end user. 
So there's really two, I suppose, main aspects of our business that people will come to use us for. So starting off, one thing that's very nice, like you mentioned the fragmentation of the insurance industry, whether it be on the data side or even drawing up different illustrations. We have so many different softwares to go to. When I started working with Larry, one of the things that I saw was that there was this vast amount of data that was, as you say, fragmented in all these different processes. So with Life Design Analysis, again, we saw a big opportunity to streamline that. So we really want it to be your your go-to software for the complete insurance sales process. So whether it's a prospect or servicing an enforced client, we want to streamline multiple different aspects of that. So, you know, an advisor uses us really for two primary points. It is a web-based system. So it is nice because you can log on from any different device. And I'd say the first component of our software is sort of that presentation aspect. So how do we make insurance more understandable to the consumer, more visual, more engaging? And we do that through data visualization. So with a partnership with LifeGuide uh, software, which which is a, a multiple quotation service that aggregates rates across all the Canadian life carriers and does life and critical illness, we give them a, a discount for LifeGuide subscribers, but they actually feed all of that data into our system so that we can make these visually compelling presentations. Um, they compare things like perhaps your existing term 10 to your conversion options, but they also might be, you know, someone has a brand new prospect and they want to compare not not just term 10, they want to show them here's how term 10 compares to term 20 to maybe term 25 to pair exactly to their mortgage. So we find there's a lot of different scenarios, but when you have an insurance opportunity, there's likely more than one fit for the client and clients these days, they certainly want options. So we use a concept sort of called asymmetrical dominance that just shows them those options, but over their specific time frame. We really want them to think about when do you want your insurance to end? Because it's likely, you know, you might take a short term term fix like a term 10 and not think about the renewal. And a lot of customers get stuck and, and as a result, age and, and can't afford insurance. Uh, and, and it's a big problem out there because there's really no solution for them once you get too old. No, there isn't. Oh, certainly not. So, I mean, really what you're looking at is you're coming in past the what we'll call the needs analysis stage when you're at the quotation stage and the basically trying to show them what their options are, illustrate them in something much prettier than the common illustrations that we get from insurers. Well, we do have needs analysis tools. So, I mean, we would start and take you really like, I mean, one way to think about it would be if you were trying to kind of accommodate all of the CLHIA's kind of needs-based selling approach tactics, everything from doing a needs analysis, attaching a reason why letter, performing that suitability analysis by comparing those different product options, Ultimately, then selling it, having the contract and storing that document, uh, including your disclosure, we would automate all of that part of it so that the presentation really only takes you a couple of really seconds or minutes to put together because it's automating all those sort of fragmented parts of, of what an advisor has to do to complete a compliant sale. You know, sort of following that is really the second part of our business that a lot of people are, are really using us for, and that's the mining and managing of a block in business. So we like to differentiate a little bit from a CRM where, you know, we definitely have contact records and storage and notes and reminders and things like that. But we're really focused on specifically the insurance industry and the problem around renewals. So what we'll do is we'll have smart notifications for things like policy opportunities, like term 10s coming up for renewal. So we'll actually remind the advisor that renewal is coming up and automatically actually run a brand new case for them. So they don't have to do anything based on their own specifications we can run some new options. And that really helps them kind of stay compliant, but also give them new sales opportunities. So we're always sort of pushing that both sides of the compliance and the sales ability. Excellent. So frankly, you know, you look, you look at the traditional illustration and it doesn't really compare much. Maybe you have like a term 10 to term 20 to term 100 comparison at the back as an option, but it's always with that same company. Now, what's the actual input of this stuff look like with you guys? And, and then what's the output look like as compared to, say, what the traditional insurers put out, which is like 30 pages of compliance and then some numbers. Yeah. So um, I like to think, I mean, ours is uh, certainly much easier. And because of that partnership, really, I mean, an advisor can run a recipe and search for three product classes. So that that comparison of term to a min funded UL to, you know, whole life or something like that could be run in, in as little as three seconds with a fully branded report customized with your logo, template, color scheme, all that kind of great professional quality. So when you actually walk into a, a meeting, you look very trustworthy. You look organized. We find there's a lot of duplication. So when you do a term 10 and a term 20, you might do them from different companies and you have very similar disclaimers on both reports, mm-hmm. slightly different fonts, branding. 
And for the customer, the more complicated it seems or appears or the harder it is to extract information, the less likely they are to actually purchase a product. They'll feel intimidated by the whole process. So because we aggregate all of this kind of information across all the, the different carriers and can bring it into these reports, we can really visualize, I sort of think about it like the digital napkin drawing where, you know, you just simply select your products. We pull in all that pricing information, all the renewals, all the cash values. And then, you know, the real secret, as I said, is that data visualization part where we put them out in the very pretty visuals that really help communicate and the, the reports are smart, so they help adjust timeframes. And, you know, in some cases, people will apply PV metrics uh, for present value, or, you know, it might be certain objections like a buy term invested difference. So we help them with all those strategies. But because the data is so accessible in the system and so easy to bring in and compare to one another, the result is they end up saving so much time because they, they remove themselves from that fragmented process of going into different softwares and printing out reports and trying to extract numbers from tables. And ultimately, they, they get a report that's more palatable and, and as a result, sell more insurance. So a couple of things I want to come back to there. But in terms of the input, I mean, I get the entire quotation of things like term tenor and funded UL. When you start getting into like overfunded UL and into uh, whole life, like what's the process there? Is there an export from those softwares? Uh, you actually managed to bake that into the system yet? Yeah, so we do have some whole life searching uh, capability in the system. Now, with the partnership with LifeGuide, they send us the guaranteed values for a lot of those plans. But like you mentioned, you know, a lot of people want to really drill down into plan design, especially when it comes to like things like overfunded UL or whole life. We've actually built an interface with every carrier software out there where you're right, a simple export to Excel gives you a massive, massive amount of data. And we just take all of that structured data, copy and paste it or save the whole file, and you can drag and drop it right in. Very easy process, but then the more information that we have on, on that particular policy, the more robust the kind of the representation of the illustration can be. All of our charts and, and then and kind of these visuals that we produce in our software are dynamic, meaning that you can toggle on and off these legends and these interactive charts to to contrast things. So, you know, for advisors, that might mean bringing in one of these spreadsheets and contrasting, say, a total cash value versus the reduced example versus the guaranteed and having them all layered over each other. You know, when we think about sort of the traditional illustration, we might have to flip to page, you know, 32 to find the minus one example, <laughs> yeah. flip back a couple pages, you know, bring it to page 14 and show them versus the primary and then try and add up even those premiums. So it's, it's a very difficult process. Um, and we just make that easy and transparent so that we can get to that yes answer a little bit faster, at least have them educated. Uh, it's amazing when clients are educated, you know, they don't really upsell themselves into these products because they're better designed for their particular needs. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had clients in the past who basically, um, basically the situation said, well, yeah, I'll take the terms. It's going to be cheaper for the next 30 years. And like, no, it's not. And they're like, what? How's that possible? And they you know, sit there, scribble down a math, and they're like, oh, my God. It's going to save me a fortune yeah, we, if I pay more now, like basically. So you mentioned dynamic. Now, is this meant to be, I mean, I know you guys do a print that report and I'm looking at the sample right now and it's quite lovely and far superior and prettier than anything any insurance companies ever put out. Who I, I keep on beating up on incumbents in this, in this podcast, but you know, it's okay. It's, it's, all, it's all support. <laughs> now, is there, is there also a, an in-person dynamic presentation type module where I can basically flip through and show people on the spot with a computer or with a projector? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll find clients use our software. Well, I'll say kind of simplistically three or four ways. Um, so one, as you mentioned, is the PDF. And I find, you know, it's still very nice to have leave behind material. Uh, inevitably, you know, after the sale or after the pitch, I should say, usually it's husband and wife want to sit down and, and think about it. So it's important to have something to leave behind. Something physical is good, but you lose that interactive ability of the charts. So the two other things that advisors really do, and it kind of depends on their behavior. So one will be if you're the type to have people in your office, there's nothing better than having a client sit down in the boardroom, big TV up on the screen with one of our reports. Because again, that level of professionalism, that branding of having this customized report up on screen where you can handle objections, like showing a reduced example and showing still how strong the cash values are and kind of going through that report and interacting with it. So that's one way advisors would use that digital report of ours with a client. So we find that happens a fair bit. But there's other advisors who, you know, maybe they're not the type to bring every client into the office. There's a lot of road warriors out there who go in and meet with 
with each one of their clients, um, whether it be at a, you know, a Tim Hortons or, you know, maybe it's at the client's office and they can bring these reports on their tablets and things like that. So the tablet makes a very personal experience, even a laptop. So they'll show up into the office and, and some of these advisors, uh, the more technical savvy ones will actually bring two tablets. So one for them, one for the client. And they both go through sort of the report themselves. Uh, and we find this is a very personal experience. You get all of those interactive abilities. And then there's sort of a third component, because even if you go and visit the client or the client comes to your office, as I mentioned, you still need that leave behind piece. If, you know, okay, I want to think about this, I'm going to take it back to my partner, my spouse to review. We actually have a, a really interesting feature in our software uh, where you can share these cases that you've created. So you might make a proposal comparing a few different options, click the share button, and then you can actually link uh, through hyperlink to your client and, and even request you know certain things like they put in their name, first name and last name before they get to the case. Um, and this is really neat because it allows the client to not only receive this kind of information on whatever platform they want. So a lot of advisors will even text this link to their client. Some will send it to prospects over LinkedIn and some will just simply email it to their client. And again, when they click on the link, they get taken to the advice, like kind of a client version of what the advisor has designed. And then they can interact with all the charts, go through the report. And I think the neat part about this is actually that the advisor gets a notification on when the client has viewed it. They get information on how long they spent on the report, what time exactly they went to the report, um, and even what pages they're engaged with. So there's a bit of a heat mapping that goes on and, and shows engagement of what their interests are while they're on the report. Interesting. I mean, that's the first client portal for insurance sales I've ever heard of. So well done. Well done. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, advisors really like it. They, you know, some have told me it's sort of like a nanny cam inside their client's home because, you know, inevitably what happens is they'll review it, spend an hour on one of these public, you know, sort of or, or shared reports, I should say, and inevitably can perfectly follow up on Monday just with the best timing ever. So, you know, just wanted to touch base on this. What did you think of the report? Fantastic. A little bit snoopy, but I like it. <laughs> that being said, <laughs> so th this is life. And now we talked about life. Have you guys, are you, do you currently do or have you looked at disability, critical illness, long term care? Yeah, so critical illness rates are built into the system. They're a great comparison, you know, contrasting a T10 to a 75 or showing the different term lengths are obvious, uh, showing the value of a return of premium or even maybe doing, say, like a, a T75 with no funding versus one with ROPD and trying to illustrate sort of a split dollar by showing that difference mm -hmm. in premium of what the employer will pay and what the client will pay or the employee would pay. Now, with DI, I mean, you can definitely illustrate it in our system. We don't have the rate search capability for it. We find it's sort of because of the pattern of the product. I mean, it's kind of two straight line projections. It's expensive and more expensive. Pretty much. Really, yeah. around, that, <laughs> really around that different weight. So we say you can certainly illustrate it. It's great to have that professional report, but it may not be the most compelling sort of presentation in the system. Now, with that being said, again, we do have powerful manual areas to input things. So I have seen even people do annuities. I've seen seg funds in there. Um, we've got a, we're starting to get a little bit more American clients in there. So we're starting to get more into these indexed ULs and, and some of the different product types out there. Yeah, and uh, the VA market is enormous. So that's uh, something that could... You can do seg funds. I mean, hopefully you can do VAs, and that's a, that's a big big opportunity there. So now that being said, that's for the new sales, but you also do tracking of of enforced policies as well, correct? Yes, exactly. So um, we saw a big opportunity where you know when I worked with my stepfather Larry, I said you know you've got a gold mine of opportunity sitting in your block of business. You know you just need a way to leverage it. And so what we've built in LDA is really uh, one and a really easy way to request from the carriers to get this information. A lot of times this information seems extremely hidden to advisors because they don't know the right channels to go to at the insurance company. So we've actually made sort of a portal that helps you and, and a templated email that helps you request this information at whatever regularity you'd like. And for some clients, we do have feeds with. So for our national accounts, we'll actually get feeds from carriers and bring that in on, on a specified time frame. Usually it's quarterly, but the better the feed, the more frequent you can bring in this information. Um, Interesting. And, so you, know, you say for your national accounts, like are these, so basically are you just tying into some pre-existing system like WealthServe or what are you doing to get that? Yeah. So we prefer to go to the carriers most of the time. We find they have the most robust data and it, it tends to have the most accuracy when we go directly to the carrier, but we can tie yeah. into different back office systems. So we have a connection with Burtgate. Uh, we are mm -hmm. working on one with WealthServe right now. Uh, so we'd like to have that functional 
W Insurance is another platform that we're looking to collaborate with as well as Kronos. So we have, uh, we're looking to create an API where basically you can pull in any of those sort of data points around clients and policies. Our view has sort of been to, again, be CRM agnostic in the fact that we would like to connect to, you know, whatever the best data source that works for the client, we can bring in that information. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I had coffee with one of the heads of innovation for a big three insurance company in Canada that will not go named. And, you know, I, I bugged him. I said, you know, last time we talked, I asked you about data feeds. Any chance I'm getting them anytime soon? To which he just laughed and said, no. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so uh, so that begs the question is how accurate or how, or how far back are you able to get policy information? I'm guessing that like more recent stuff might be easily accessible. But I mean, if you're looking at a 20, 30 year old policy, are you able to get that through the exports? Or are you requesting that simply like as an Excel spreadsheet? Yeah, so it depends on the carrier. So about five carriers out there have um, kits feeds for enforced data, but there's some there's some great people at these companies who don't have feeds who still manually package up this information. So, oh god, um, you know, I get the challenge <laughs> on the insurer side when they say, "Well, we don't want to do all this. These kind of requests cost us money." So I appreciate that side of it, but you know, you what? know we it's are costly. able to get. I have a serious issue with that because no, what it really is doing is costing them business. The fact that they are exactly. not actually providing these data feeds for people to actually do to service clients better, find opportunities, find upsell, cross sell opportunities, they are costing themselves a bloody fortune by not upgrading. Yeah, and I think the biggest one is this cost of acquisition of the customer. I think that always gets Huge. ignored in the equation because you know inevitably it's this sort of term ten hamster wheel, and we kind of joke that you know we sell a term ten policy and we say, okay, thanks, see you never. But it happens all too often. I mean, we're hearing about this doctor out in out in BC who's uh, suing an other unnamed big three company for this exact kind of customer experience issue. But you know, if we were proactive and, and went to that client, you know, three years before with a message saying, you know, we can prevent your premium from going from one hundred to nine hundred, as opposed to, hey, your premium's going to one hundred to nine hundred. Contact us if you need anything. See you later. Yep. No. Exactly. Yeah. It's like here. Here's your notice one month before it happens. <laughs> yeah, I've always loved that. So in addition to just storing this information, you're you you're clearly like looking for the oper- data mining for opportunities and pre-existing policies, and presenting that to the, to the advisor, right? So yeah, so you're basically finding an opportunity. And, and, and you know, I, I can, I'm pretty sure you're aware of this company, but uh, there was a precursor to you guys, I know it was Enforce Pro that I dealt with, and they eventually ended up becoming proprietary and no longer available to the general public. But they were powerful at that too. I mean, they they were fighting hard for data feeds. And putting together presentations and data mining, but I mean, I think you guys have definitely taken the presentation to another level. And you know, the ability to to me, it's a no brainer. Like you look at what you guys charge, which is, I believe, what was it, thirty to ninety dollars a month, depending on the package, fifty to ninety. That's right. And and we also have again, if you're a life guide subscriber, we have discounts for you. If you have a particular MGA that you work through, we generally work with your MGA uh, mm-hmm. to provide sort of a discount in exchange for promotion. But you're totally right on the fees. So Enforce Pro, I think they focus. Almost a hundred percent on that enforce side, not so much on like they had a presentation, but it wasn't I think as it was as, good, you say, but as it's robust. Not, as, not as nice as yours, absolutely not as customizable and things yeah. like that, but uh, again, I think they were extremely challenged on feeds with the kind of schedules uh, we've set up a lot of templates to try and sort of relieve that internal pressure inside of our organization around getting that information for you. One of the other things that we've done is because a lot of new proposals come through our system is we've added this ability to mark a policy as sold, which will save the entire yeah. dual schedule. And this was really birthed out of the need of, of all these term 10 policies renewing at YRT rates. Because, you know, when we talk about feeds and, and lack of data, even if you have a carrier with, let's say, the best feed, which is probably Manulife with their feed, you only get the initial premium on a term 10. You don't get those renewal points. No, you and don't. And with a traditional client, even, you know, going into that file and looking at the contract, you might have five renewal points depending on the age, right? Like if they buy it at 40, you have 50, 60, 70, 80, yep. and maybe up to the 85, eight, some of them expire at 80. With YRT policies, you know, if the client's 40, when they turn 50, they're going to have an individual data point all the way up to age 85. And so reviewing a YRT renewing term 10 in the future will be nearly impossible without having marked it as sold in our system. Because if you've ever tried to review even a YRT UL policy, you know that you get a cost per thousand sheet scanned back to you and you go, okay, great. Now I got to go to Excel and, uh, and basically model out this plan. Yeah, no, it's it's a challenge. I mean, there's a lot of the technical challenges around insurance, and clearly you're facing them all head on. So do you do any other types of integrations at this point? You mentioned a couple, so let's go down the list. You said LifeGuide. You say you're integrating it with some insurance company software. Is there any other talk about maybe CRM integration or any other products like that? 
Yeah, so one of the ones we're working on is Kronos. So we'd like to integrate with Kronos, and we're working on that API to bring across different information. Kind of been keeping our eye on a couple different companies. One of the companies that I'm really intrigued by out there is Vineo. I think they're doing great things to... Yeah, to push forward that movement around the same thing. And Blue Sun actually does have a new CRM out there too. So like I said, we'd like to integrate with them. Another one that's on our radar that who we're talking to is Razor Plan. So when we think about holistic planning and bringing, you know, we often see a, a certain, everyone's got their kind of unique niche focus. And when these systems talk to each other, we, we really do make better plans for our clients. So we'd like to integrate some of the insurance data into these financial plans that people are making on the financial side um, and vice versa. You know, when you make a financial plan and you find a net estate deficit, we'd like to send that number back for some options inside of life design analysis and, and help share, you know, some insurance solutions that can cover that. Excellent. So a couple of last questions I typically ask. How big is your team right now? So the team is is approaching 10. So we've got myself, uh, Barry. We've got John, Nick, and Melissa in kind of the London office. Well, Barry's out of Toronto, but in the London office. So that's at five. And then we have a couple consultants that work for us. So we've got Tom out in BC. We're just bringing on one out east as well. So I can I can announce that hopefully shortly. Um, and then our dev team is kind of about three dedicated people. But we have a really interesting partnership with a company we grew up with here in London, who we actually share office space and work intimately with. Um, we have about access to about 50 marketing and, and development people. So um, it's really neat how we can scale up and scale kind of back when we need to. So, you know, if we get a big project, uh, we can deliver extremely quickly, but we're not incurring the cost of a 50-person dev team all the time. Excellent. That's a, that's a nice little feature to have there. So yeah. in terms of the challenges you've faced in designing this software and in the business, what do you think the biggest ones have been? I mean, again, I, I always say it's, and it's probably a familiar theme amongst your podcast. It's really the cooperation from, I think, the industry partners. So I think our partners out there have been phenomenal in providing us with information and providing us with access. But it's always everyone's in the risk mitigation business. So we keep hearing about all these cybersecurity woes. And so, you know, the reluctance to share data and put data out there into all these different companies and, you know, even seeing some of the GDPR regulations come down makes sort of this data soup a very interesting challenge for all of the companies out there. So I think quality of data and we always hear, you know, legacy. So understanding Especially the insurance <laughs> industry. Yes. I have this running joke that the reason why they don't, I'm still getting some reports in dot matrix printouts is because they haven't replaced those computers because they're just waiting for all the people who are insured on those computers to die off. That way they don't have to upgrade. <laughs> that's I joke, the last but I'm pretty sure that's, that's, I'm, yeah, exactly. I, I joke, but I'm pretty sure that that is a consideration. It's like, hmm, how many people do we have on that computer that's sitting there using vacuum tubes? Oh, okay. We'll just wait. We'll just wait. It can't, can't be much longer. It can't be too much longer. Um, yeah. The other thing I would say is is on the, you know, sort of the proprietary side. So we sort of touched on fragmentation a little bit before. And I think in the industry, there's this build from within culture that almost yeah. needs to go away because we're all, and it sort of happens in the third party market too. You know, we're all sort of, we're trying to build the same systems and, and we really need to kind of say, okay, do we really, does everyone really need to have their own e-app? Does okay. everyone really oh, need that drives me insane. That, you know, the, 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 the lack of a unified electronic application just drives me insane. And I think that there's, there's few industries other than insurance that, that see friction as a means of keeping more business. To me, the optimal would be an e-app where I literally select what I'm trying to apply for, what I'm actually, which carriers I want to put each line of business with. And then I get one intuitive online e-app that basically I populate once for everybody. But trying to get these guys to actually cooperate on one e-app is like mission impossible. And that's what we're trying to do. So we're actually working with a couple different companies out there. They're starting to get this sort of API client off idea at certain companies. So what we we foresee is, you know, a flow that comes from, okay, I get a notification from LDA that I've got a policy opportunity. I run my reports and I say, you know, here are the companies I'd consider based on the research I've done and, and send it out to them digitally through that shared link I talk about. In that shared link, with each plan, you can have a link to eApp. And again, if a consumer decides to buy it now, we have all the contact information from the import. We can simply populate it. And then again, once it gets issued, it comes into the back office and pulls right back into LDA for more notifications in the future. So we really, you know, we're, this year is all about eApps and, and really trying to complete that circle around a policy sale. Well, as an advisor in this country, let me ask you, let me just say one thing, please make it happen because, uh, you know, <laughs> Like I still haven't used some of the online application softwares because I find them just to be very cumbersome, very 
you know, not, not user friendly in many, in many ways. And then again, if I don't want to put everything with one business, with one company, I'm doing three different types of policies as I did recently. It's actually just easier for me to print up the paper. And that's saying a lot because it still takes hours to fill out the three different applications. Yeah. And that's really the challenge, as you say. And, and I think, again, when advisors who do present on paper with a traditional illustration, it doesn't make sense to transition and pull out the computer if a client says, OK, I want to apply. So we sort of we're going to apply on the device that we present on. So if you're not presenting on something digitally, which none of these companies have a digital presentation solution. No. then there's no way we can easily transition to an e-app. And I think I see, you know, average time for e-apps are still something like 25 minutes at, in some cases. And it's because we have to re-input so much information. So again, we've already collected the client's information to do the original illustration yeah. that we sold them on the product. And now we're going to re-enter it again in the e-app where we're also going to do another illustration. So or, I think, or one you know, better, the data mining the, through an API, the, the information in the CRM. To basically, you know, take care of every piece of information we possibly can right down to employer name, address, right? I mean, it should literally, I mean, when we, if you have a holistic practice where you're basically doing financial planning and otherwise, you already have everything except for the medical information. And in some cases, you have partial medical information, but everything other than medical information is already in, probably in your CRM. So really, it should be like, click button, what are you applying for? Okay, now here's the medical questions. Exactly. Click of no, course, no, no, I, done. Yeah. Of course, I'm a bit of a And genius. it's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, again, I think we'll see it uh, start to move. Like, we hope to bring it out fairly shortly. So it's one of our big goals for this year. And I think it, it will really force the other carriers who are, you know, maybe trying to design within to say, you know, we need a better solution. We need to be part of this. And, and I think it gets even more interesting with some of these instant issue products where, you know, you think about that process of presentation to, to eApp. But, you know, you could have your client covered there sitting five minutes after shaking hands. Oh, I know. And that's it, it's... In a world where I can get something delivered by drone from Amazon shortly, depending on where I live, <laughs> I have same day delivery in Toronto for Amazon, right? Like I, I can get anything delivered in a couple hours. And to think that in this day and age, it takes that long to go through an application, let alone, you know, the underwriting process where God forbid it needs an APS and let's see how long it takes the doctor to get back to you. I mean, we still tell clients, you know, expect a two to three month journey on this thing. And that is just like... <laughs> Two to three months. I mean, the only thing that's going to take longer is building a house these days. But, you know, what can I say? <laughs> I know. So, and then think about the client who got the one month renewal letter. Hey, your premium is going to this. But by the way, it'll take you three months to get new insurance. I oh, mean, it's absolutely. just a huge liability that we're leaving out there. And beyond that, I mean, you think about temporary insurance amounts and how small they're, what they're capped at, right? You deal with a large size policy. You know, have plenty of policies where, you know, the temporary insurance cap is exceeded, right? So I can't even collect the check. So you have people who are in the underwriting process who are willing to pay for this, who are just waiting for the thing to come in. Maybe it takes three to four months because, you know, doctors bat letters back and forth. And they're sitting there unexposed. They're sitting there exposed when they can be covered. It's, it, it makes very little sense. So other question I'd like to ask everybody before they get off the podcast is uh, what excites you about what you're working on or the industry or the opportunities you're seeing? Well, I'm really excited on this sort of education. So, uh, you know, everyone's, you know, I think very bullish on robos and we hear so much disruption from robos, but I'm actually really bullish on advisors. We've always really taken the approach that, you know, the advisors have a lot of value. They need the tools that a robo has. So they need a dual focused approach, but I'm really excited about, you know, the kind of the consumer experience. So I, I really envision kind of a process where a consumer can come on, you know, say a generic site and do a little bit of research. I think Lemur says that 85% of consumers like to go on online and do some research. So I see, you know, talking to a chat bot when you want, but inevitably, you know, they want to validate their decision. They want to talk to an advisor and, and I'd like to connect them to a qualified advisor that has the right kind of tools to allow them to do a deeper dive send out that you kind of the e-app, the link and, and have them covered in a process where they can get educated through artificial intelligence. They can get educated from a real person. Mm -hmm. They can transact really on their own terms. So, so I really see something that involves the advisor at every step, but you know, really gives the option to, to transact on your own, uh, on terms. But I, I'd say for me, really, I always think about, because I am a consumer, not an advisor, I think about that consumer journey. And I think about, you know, how can I make the advisor deliver the experience that I would want to purchase an insurance policy? And again, I've done it recently and I kind of, I even laugh, you know, I kind of laughed at my advisor who uses LDA. And I said, you still got a lot of other forms. And, and that was where we started incorporating things like reason why letters. And we're working on things like digital signatures to really tie that loop together and it's really make it easy because if it's not easy as you say amazon will do it people will buy that uh, gadget off of uh, amazon because it's easy and it comes right away i get instant gratification 
hey, they're getting into uh, health insurance now with their own uh, for themselves. I mean, it's just a matter of time before they're turned to ride towards more traditional forms. Exactly. When you yeah. when you search for that blowtorch, they're going to know you're in a dangerous situation, offer you life and That's accidental it. dismemberment. Yeah, just pitch in situation. Alexa, buy me another $2 million worth of term 10. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's done. Yeah. No, I mean, well, they probably know more about us than we know about ourselves. But that's another note. Well, thank you yet again, Charlie. That was great. I hope everybody is going to enjoy this. And thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. And that was my interview with Charlie Conron. I encourage you to take a look at Life Design Analysis if you are in the insurance market. And with that, as always, if you enjoy this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is you get your podcasts. Until next time, I'm Jason Pereira. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.